right? Well, welcome to the gaff. Um, you know, I know this kind of seems like a my clipboard and pen makes it a bit uh, formal. I look like a, a CNBC interview, but you know, super casual. And I'm really appreciative of you being here, um, Brian Chin. Uh, for those of for my audience who probably isn't familiar with you, which is I, I assume more young people, um, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna give them a quick synopsis of sure. based on you know your um your resume. So and this is just a fraction of your you know portfolio. Sure. Um, sure. I just thought it was the most relevant. Um, so you're a retired U.S. Marine Corps Reserve with 30 years on combined service in private sector and as a defense contractor. You have an extensive experience in complex overseas assignments, advising and mentoring partner nation security forces, Mm -hmm. an extensive experience in complex overseas assignments, advising and mentoring partner nation security forces. Um, Apart from your combat arms specialty as an artillery officer, you earned additional specialties as a Latin America foreign area officer um, and a civil affairs officer. And you're a and you're also certified in information operations, which is essentially influencing decision makers. So, um, welcome. And Thank you. I'm excited. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, you know how how are you doing? Good, good, good. Just good. just to um, give some context, you're. I just want my viewers to know that you're Guyanese. Born and raised. Born and raised, yeah. and also the. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the highest ranking. Um, Guyanese in the U.S. military? I think so. I haven't come across anybody. I did come across once the um, the commander of the Washington, D.C. National Guard okay. was a one-star general, a brigadier general. Um, that is a, that is more of an appointed position, but he's, he er, certainly earned his rank. So I think technically he would be the most senior um, U.S. military officer of Guyanese birth that I know. Okay. Yeah. And what, what was your military rank? I'm a full bird colonel. And what does that mean? Uh, so there's, um, in general, company grade officers, so lieutenant through captain, and then field grade officers, majors through lieutenant colonel and full bird colonel, and then the general or flag officers, the, the one star general, two, three, and four star general. Okay. So, so I, I would have um, culminated at the highest rank of a field grade officer. Um, one other caveat on that is that it's it's usually the first in the U.S. military, at least, it's usually the first rank where you you kind of keep your rank throughout your the rest of your life. You 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 refer to colonel as a colonel for the rest of your life, and so on. Mm-hmm. And and being a chin of Chinese descent, your parents never asked you how come you didn't get the general. You know that um, th- that question has you know come up mostly with friends and stuff. Yes, you're right. Chinese are are um, drivers and and pushers for for the pinnacle. Um, but I think that that um, especially in the U.S., most people have a very keen sense of the military. And they understand that, um, or they feel that 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 achieving a rank of colonel is is quite significant, and um, and then that pyramid really really nugs down to the general officer rank. So I, I was just extraordinarily fortunate, and I think I was just a product of the times, um, all the. Um, all of the stuff that the U.S. has been involved in is probably the only reason that I made colonel. Um, most people, the, the average officer would probably retire as a major. So I made major and then lieutenant colonel and then colonel. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, I, yeah, that's amazing. I just had to throw that joke in there to no, lighten the no, mood. No, 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 <laughs> totally get it, totally get it. Um, so, Brian, how come, uh, wh- why are you back in Guyana? How come you've decided to move back and, and um, you know, be a part of, of you know, we, we, and we're happy to have you. We need more people with your expertise. But um, why leave the U.S. to come back and, and give back and serve here in, in a different way? Yeah, great question. So huh, for starters, um, way back, in, oh, uh, I, was, um, I was interviewed for a book called Guyanese Achievers in America. 
and, and, and <laughs> maybe they were short of people, but they picked me to be one of them. And um, in, in, the, in the interview, I mentioned that, that in all the years of attending Carabana in Toronto, and I, I would look over that big mass of people and say, wow, what would Guyana be like if those people hadn't left? And um, at that time, my father himself was living abroad, and he was just in the midst of making a decision to re-migrate. He did. He wrote a very successful book about his experience growing up in Guyana. And um, so he set the stage for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think it all the timing just came together at the right time. When I, I retired in 2016, and of course, that was a year after Guyana had just discovered oil. And um, I guess my choices at the time, um, I had just come out of a, a, a five-year tour in the Middle East. And my option would have been to go back again or come to Guyana. And just Guyana just seemed very exciting. It just felt like I could make a big difference. Yeah. And so here it's, I am. It's funny you say that. Between the two options of going back on tour or coming to Guyana, Guyana seemed more exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, mean, I guess you want different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's fantastic. And, and like I said, we're glad to have you back. Um, we need more people like you coming back, uh, especially in this time. And for many reasons we'll get into, um, you know, in this chat. I guess the first question I wanted to ask you is, you know, based on your years of military experience, um, just in broad terms, what is the mindset behind serving your country as, as a military man in the United States of America? Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that sure. space. Um, and many Guyanese perhaps aren't familiar with what that means here. But, you know, the U.S. is known to have one of the strongest, if not the strongest military in the world. Mm-hmm. And I, I would like to know, like, how does that, how, how do you reconcile that with, you know, being in the military and service the country and, and, you know, your, your outlook on, on, on that. Okay. Well, let me start off by saying that I actually spent more, t- more of my life in the United States than in Guyana. I, I, I w- migrated when I was uh, about 17, and I won't say my age now, but it's much older than 17. And um, I, I had always been very attracted to the military, and um, I actually started off as an Army ROTC cadet in university yeah. and then switched over to the Marines. I, um, I, I can't say that, that I knew I was, I always knew that I was going into the military, but by the time I had had a taste of officer candidate school in the, in the United States, and I attended OCS while I was in university, I really got hit with a sense, and especially for the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps, but the U.S. military is just a very small, very, very small percentage of the U.S. population. And the U.S. Marine Corps is just tiny and just a very unique institution. Um, you know, if you, ask, um, if you ask somebody in America, why is the, uh, what's different about the Marines, you know? They usually can't explain the difference, but they know there's a significant difference. And I'm not saying that to put down the other services, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, but there's something just very, very unique about the institution, the the United States Marines. And that seems to have transcended all around the world because many other countries have Marine Corps and uh, and they tend to excel and and be a big part of um, uh, not just the defense sector in that country, but they tend to be a, just a big, important part of society. So I would say that um, selfless service is a big thing. Um, feeling very patriotic. For me, there was a feeling of wanting to give back. You know, I had gone to the States in, in 1980, and, and I had a strong sense that I wanted to contribute something to, the, to my new home. Um, and then, and then, of course, like like many young men, I was very attracted to the to the lifestyle, the the, the physical mm-hmm. nature, the physical challenges of the military career. Yeah. But, but service and a strong sense of duty and honor is, is was a very big factor, as it is for I'm sure many most of my peers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, at your undisclosed age, you're in great shape. So I I, I feel like that's just a part of you. Thank you. And um, that does seem like something that is 
prevalent in, in, in the military, you know, that the physical um, endurance and um, being in shape and dare I say being combat ready. I don't want to yeah. throw that around loosely, but, um, you know, I know that in the U.S. especially, the, the idea of service is in, in, in large parts of society is embedded in the culture mm -hmm. um, relative to Guyana, I would yes. say. It's, I don't want yeah, yeah. I want to say I want to compare, right? So, you know, and based on your your limited experience here, you know, what what are your how do you see the public outlook towards um local military uh or or, or service here rather not not military. I want to say this idea of service. That question. So I'm sorry to interject and I'm saying this because as a young man, I've never once considered for whatever reason, maybe it's my privilege or, or whatever, but joining the military. Yeah. I totally get it. You know, Alex, since I've been back to Guyana, I very frequently, and especially now in these times, I offer to help in the defense sector. I offer to help in many, many roles. But one of the things, one of the offers I made, and I won't say who I made it to very recently, was was to try to change the culture in Guyana in that respect. To I tried to explain to the person I was speaking to that coming from the Marines, I understand what it's like to be part of a very elite organization where you could be very proud and people really looked up to you in society. I, I couldn't begin to, to describe to you what it's like walking around in a marine uniform in the US. It's just it's just a very proud service. People are always buying you drinks. Airline pilots move you up to first class and on and on. It's it's just it's just a, an experience that I would relish the opportunity to make a go at trying to instill that in Guyana. Try because I don't think you know e even you know law enforcement is the same thing and and, and the first responders but the military and that culture is certainly not looked up at in the same way as they do in the States, and you've rightly pointed that out, but, but it can be changed. It can be changed with the right messaging, with the right recruiting, with the right um, the cultural mindset. So you know, there's so much that, that, that positive will, that I feel will come to Guy in, in time once, once we can change that mindset. And I, I, I would really like to be a part of that, to just you know, change the way young people look at, at the military so that some young person would say to his dad or so on, you know, I want to be a, in the Guyana Defense Force. I want to serve my country. You know? yeah. And, and I, I absolutely get that that is not a, a purpose, that is not a, a direction, that is not a drive that, that many people in Guyana just, just see as an opportunity in grasp yeah and that's unfortunate no i i agree uh there's and there's a lot of good um good attributes with that patriotism of course which we're really pushing now discipline hard work yeah. um you know and just this sort of togetherness and moving as a unit and and that's um that's super important i i too hope at some point like we can catalyze the drive in that direction. I think there's a lot of positive yeah. to come out of that, not only for military capacity, but just as to, to sort of straighten out our, our, our culture a, a, a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I love what you said in response to my question about, you know, um, th this idea of, of service, because what's nice, um, it seems in the US, is that you have the backing of the citizenry, yes. Yes. you know, which-, which It's a which, huge deal. Yeah, 100%. Um, and that's patriotism, really. I, I would say I've never seen a Guyana Defense Force decal on a car here in Guyana. But but I would very proudly have a decal. And my, my license tag in Miami is a United States Marine Corps license tag. So I could proudly say and, and you know to anybody, including a, a state trooper pulling me over for speeding, that you know I, I, I'm a... I'm connected to the U.S. Marines, and, and chances are they let me off. It's just, it's just that kind of, yeah. you know, th th there's a lot of pride in it. Do you think there's any um, cross-connection with here? Any, um, like, that casual relationship with, for example, local law enforcement or local military with um, international service members, like, if, like yourself, for example? 
if you were to flash it, that credential? It has. I, I've done it. I've, I've, um, I've on more than one occasion. You know, we have a, 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 a we have a society that just seems to bring you in contact with law enforcement more than it's necessary. Uh, it's just the nature of our society. Tell um, me about it. I mean, I went through three roadblocks just coming to see you here tonight. Yeah. And um, but I've I've had occasions where you know I um was questioned and and I produced my credentials and 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 more and in every instance it was well received and 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 they showed me a, a professional courtesy. So yes. Nice. Yeah. Um, before we move on, and I just kind of want to just one more question on this sort of uh, on the topic of you know national service. What do you think we can do here in Guyana to put more trust in our in our you know um, the the service members like like the police for example uh, not necessarily the army but I know there there are a lot of problems with um, our well with our policing um, and just I guess there's a trust factor missing there and I won't get into why I think we 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 all know you know with regards to corruption or, you know, whatever issues that face the force at times and that people complain about. But there has to be a way that we can sort of, you know, buy into our service members and put that trust in them to keep us safe and and them meeting us halfway as well. Because I think that'll go a long way for our country or just feeling of security and unity and patriotism. Like, what what is like a simple step forward i know you don't have the answer but like what would you sort of recommend for us to like begin this sort of process yeah well let me caveat the question by saying that so i've offered and and even in the previous government in guyana because again i came in uh, i came in 2017 they they took my offer in a very very limited way and had me train um police officers in a very kinetic fashion and I, I made the argument, and I did not succeed, that you know you, you could spe- I, I could spend time teaching policemen how to do a roadblock, how to, to do a lot of combatives, but that's not what the guy in a police force really needs. You pointed it out just now. The guy in a police force needs to be a better liked and a better trusted organization, and I would much rather spend my time trying to, to level off and, sh- and show them how, how the Marines that I come from were able to achieve that status, how in the way we carry ourselves and how we build a reputation, the way, the way from the very basic at boot camp, how you instill a pride, and then, then they go home and they're very proud in front of their parents. Um, so you're very right to say that, that I believe that Earning the trust in, in society today and the love of society is the single most um, is the single most important thing for the Guyana Police Force to do. I don't think that the Guyana Defense Force is doing it as, as poorly as the police are right now, but I think they can do, they can go a long ways to building up that image and that kind of mystique about them. Yeah, um, it's a, big, it's we, a PR we, issue. It, it's a PR issue, and I, and I got to tell you, if um, after this, you must take some time and let me share some, um, just some of the, the, the 60 second advertising that the Marine Corps uses. And, and you know, whatever I've seen company some, yeah. it is, it, it, it's just yeah. superb. You know, yeah. they don't offer you anything, they ask you to give of yourself, and they just have a way of building this pride. And, and, the, and you know, so somehow the Ghana Defense Force can copy a lot of that and, and just, just kind of. Instill, and it won't happen overnight. It's a, it's it's almost a generational thing. Yeah, but it can happen. It really can happen. You know, I I like where this is going. So I'm just gonna tack in a little bit more. A lot of critics of the police force, um, especially those in in, in political um, bodies. You know, like especially like opposition or whoever's opposition at the time would um, and citizenry and our citizens as well would argue that oh, you know, this whole issue with um the police is down to wages and the the lack of wages they could be paid more but i don't feel like i what you said is super important and i don't feel like it's just an issue of paying someone more because without the foundation of those values you you presented you know you give 
someone any amount of money, that doesn't change their outlook. That doesn't change their discipline, their methods. You know, um, obviously, you know, to collect in a small piece and stuff like that is, is a big thing in, in society, societal transactions with law enforcement. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, do you think that like just increasing salary would would do as much as people are making it out to be? Or what percentage improvement would you attribute that to? Yeah, if, if I had to do that, if I had to answer that question, I would try to be as scientific as possible and I would like take some, some other countries and compare, do a comparative s- study mm-hmm. just to see the difference. Because like, you know, so home for me when I'm not in Guyana is Miami. And a typical police officer lives in a fairly nice house and drives a nice car. So he is he's he's at a certain point in society, and, and so I would try to compare that relatively to where a police officer fits into our society. So I you know and try to have a par. I mean you know the the, the military and the police are never going to be high paid professions, but they don't have to be at the bottom rung either. They're living with dignity. Especially, right, you have to give them a, you have to give them a dignified wage and, and, and that's commiserate with the kind of responsibilities that you expect them to uphold. But, um, but I, I, I would agree with you that it's not just a pay issue. Increasing their pay, they're a reflection of, of Guyanese society and that's a terrible road for me to go down in a public interview like this, yeah. but they are a reflection of, of a society that has a high level of of um, normalizing that kind of behavior. Yeah. So you know they they feel that 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 they're just doing what everybody else does in in their in their format in their manner, and of course we refer to that you know yeah. that that predatory policing that that you know we're trying to fix in Guyana. Sure. Yeah, and, and again, it, to that point, it's like you know, this is not any attack on the on the on the institutions that that you know basically run or help run our society. Um, if anything, we want the best for for these yeah. these guys, and you know, serving regardless of their reputation. Right now, yeah. it's 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 a privilege to be able to serve and have people serve for our country. We need the police. We need law enforcement. Um, super important, regardless. Well, l- let's be clear on this. I am sure that the majority of, of our law enforcement officers in Guyana are very well intentioned and very professional and that they join the police and the army for the right reasons. Um, but it's just one of those things where, where institutionally and culturally, they, they, you know, they, it, there'll be some negative impacts on them. And we as society, instead of just castigating them all the time, we have to work together to create the conditions to, as you mentioned earlier, uplift their status in society, um, make them prouder, um, make them fit relatively, as I mentioned earlier, relatively into a better role in society. Um, But I I, want to make it very clear that I'm sure many, many of our young policemen join because they think it's a noble career and they want to serve. Um, I, 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 you, I couldn't quote any figures on if they, it, they stay on that path, but I, I'd like to believe that. Yeah, maybe hopefully in the future we can, we can sort of begin to collect information, not necessarily in a negative regard, but just to sort of know uh, what our retention is and stuff like that. It would just be good to understand how that's working because we need that information to effect some sort of change. So mm-hmm. I'm hopeful. Um, I'm just, just going to pivot back to you now. Um, and thank you for offering your insight into that. Uh, would you be able to briefly run me through your sort of, um, your tenure within the military and what kind of operations you were, um, you, you, you took part in? Uh, the kind of service you did, and and again, I know, uh, you know, uh, in a guy like you, uh, Colonel, I know there's a lot of things you, you you can't talk about, and I totally understand that. But I'll ask you questions along the way. But I just want to sort of a brief overview of of your experience, because I think that would go a long way um, to sort of build on the conversation we're about to have, and and, and the sort of uh, world um, th- that this looks like, you know. Okay. Okay, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch yes, of the perfect. highlights and then you could pick it apart afterwards. So 
like everybody uh, in the service as an officer, I, I was commissioned as second lieutenant. It was like the very first thing that happened, like like I had just reported to my base after my, you know, coming through the train and pipeline and the balloon went up in Panama. And I, I just happened to join a unit that was on what's called the air alert or the contingency battalion. And so we, I got a very early dose as a second lieutenant uh, as to how, why and how the United States military is so can so quickly go into to a response mode, to respond to a crisis. Um, they plan to a very high detail. And I remember back then that as soon as we got the word that we could be going to Panama, I, I immediately know, knew what plane I was going to be on and what seat I was going to be on, on a plane. Um, as it turned out, we went to Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina to fly out, and it didn't happen because um, the circumstances in Panama lended itself more to the United States Army, and so the Army went, so we stood down. First thing out of the way. I had a very um, traditional early career as, a, as an artillery officer. I did deployments to um, Okinawa, Japan, to Korea. I think the Korea deployment was very um, noteworthy because I went in 1988 during the Olympic Games. Okay. You would say, why were the Marines in Korea during the Olympic Games? Well, the Marines had an exercise, a large exercise as an excuse to bring a lot of Marines into the country at a time because at the time there was a feeling that North Korea would attack and, and disrupt the games. So my unit, my battalion went up on the, the DMZ with with North Korea, and I spent the Olympics up there. Um, did, did anything happen? Was there any, uh, you know, no, conflict? No, 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 they didn't. Um, just, just not too long before the Olympics, the North Koreans had shot down a civilian airliner, and that had really um, caused a, a lot of concern for the 1988 Olympics. But um, no, they, you know, and I like, I'd like to think that you know maybe it's a high level of deterrence that 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 the U.S. and the South Korean showed that you know. Um, after my, then so I want to make it clear that I got in and out of the military quite a few times, and the latter part of my career was as a reserve officer. So so usually in roles as a defense contractor, and then called up for active duty for something or the other. What I quickly got called to act, well, first of all, I was in Okinawa, Japan, when the balloon went up for the first Gulf War. And, the um, balloon? The, the, well, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Okay. And um, I did not deploy then because I was just up against my, my time to leave the, the military. So I got up, got out, volunteered, once it looked like we were going to go, go fight got called back in, but didn't deploy. So I went into civilian life and then started to get called up. I, I started to live in the southern part of the U.S. in South Florida. Right, can I, I just interject? Why, why did you leave? Uh, or what, my, my time was you, up. How, how long is the service? I, well, most initial contracts are for four years. Gotcha. So along the four and a half okay. year mark, I, I got out of service for the first time. And give civilian life, and and it's quite um, in a peacetime military, especially back then. It's not as easy to stay in the military. I mean, apart from being lured out, it's a, it's actually not always easy to stay in the military. It's a pyramid where they're cutting officers off the yeah. side to, to blind to, demand, right? To go up that pyramid, and um, at that time, when I first got out in 1991 or so the United States was going through a recession and there was a big cutback on the military. So all, you know, my peers and I were all bailing to look for greener pastures. Then I started to fall into this role. I'll tell you this really interesting story. I got a telephone call and it was to tell me, ask me if I wanted to go to Bolivia on a counter-narcotics mission. And when I asked, the guy from headquarters, Marine Corps, said, listen, we need a combat arms guy. You're a combat arms guy. We need somebody to speak Spanish. You're from South America. And um, so we want to know if you want to go. Now, of course, Guyana, only English-speaking country in South America. I didn't look 
speak a lick of Spanish, but I didn't say a word. Mm. I immediately said yes. I found out that the guy who was going fell out a boat while he was training to go, and the boat behind ran and, and, and hit him in the head mm. and, and really hurt him. And so, so they were quickly looking for a replacement to go to a mission in a very remote place in, in, in Bolivia. So I had, I literally had four weeks to get ready to go. I paid for one-on-one -on -one intensive Spanish classes <laughs> and just spent the four weeks, A, getting in shape physically, and I, I was not in bad shape at the time, and learning to speak Spanish. And I deployed to Bolivia. So Jim and, Jim and Rosetta Stone. Jim, four, uh, four well, well, no, but I had this live teacher at okay. the time because this is kind of pre-Rosetta uh, Stone days, I think. <laughs> And, um, and as it turned out, I went to a very remote part of Bolivia and there was one officer in the unit who spoke fairly good English so I could converse. And, so um, there weren't any other... Advisor. Most of them didn't speak a lot of English. It was a very remote area. Um, it was called Trinidad, Bolivia. And, and you were um, the only U.S.? There, no, no. I, I, there were some DEA oh, okay. agents. There were some U.S. Coast Guard agents and... and we ran an operation to help the Bolivians because um, they're a source country for cocaine. And so at, at the time, we, the U.S. was very hands-on in, in, in stemming the, the, the production of cocaine, uh, coca there. Like literally four weeks into my trip, the only English-speaking officer on the Bolivian side who was a deputy commander got killed. And so for the rest of the trip, I really had to hurry up and learn to speak Spanish. So once I did that role and I was able to pass the Spanish test, I, I, I started to fulfill all the requirements to be a foreign area officer. And from there, I went to, to a, a, a sequel of deploying to Colombia, deploying to Nicaragua, deploying to Mexico, um, deploying to Peru, all in counter narcotics roles. And then 9 11 happened. And I switched from being a, a counter narcotics guy in this part of the world to deploying to, to Iraq first in 2006. And then for the next, for the rest of my career, I worked in, in Iraq. And, mm -hmm. and I, 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 my focus was, was somehow supporting or the, what was called at the time the long war, the, 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 you know, the crisis in uh, operation in Iraq, and then uh, and, and simultaneously in Afghanistan. So I did a year in Iraq and, and um, five years in, in Afghanistan and the region. How fascinating to have um, jumped around Central South America and then across the world to the Middle East. It's just the way the world, the geopolitics yeah. change. Yeah. You know, at, at one time, you know, the war on drugs was the war. Yeah. And of course, that came to a fairly quick end once 9-11 happened. I'm assuming that's your thumbnail, right? Because that, yeah. that was excellent. Yeah. I, um, yeah. so I have a ton of questions now. Yeah. Um, you know, and this might be a little, a little controversial, but, um, you know, you talk about it's sort of a, your deployment as a response to the geopolitics at the time. And I know that, you know, in military, you're sort of, you follow the, 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 the country's goals and aims and, and whatever um, plans they have. How do you reconcile your, uh, your personal individual <laughs> opinions on geopolitics versus what your country requires of you? Um, and I'm saying that because I'm assuming not everyone totally buys into one specific objective. Um, and I know that's a hard question and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but a, a, an, an amateur non-military guy is just, like me is just curious as to how that. Yeah, that, that is a, a great question. And I'll say that I think I've been very fortunate. Maybe I was a bit naive. I think that in all my deployments, especially the ones to the Middle East, I think we were still caught up in a sense of righteousness that we were doing the right thing. I, um, I, I can tell you that when I was in Iraq, I, 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 I never had a sense that I was there to kill people. I had a sense that I was there to help, and I had a role that, that, that was a very helping role. 
I, um, I helped move large quantities of money around Iraq. And in the back of my mind, this money was going to people to help jumpstart the economy and blah, blah, blah. And so it, it felt very noble. And I, I, remember, I remember when I was leaving Iraq a year later, I remember speaking to a, a, my, my interpreter, and I actually brought her, I sponsored her and her family to come to America, and she's, she's still here in Michigan, and she's had some children in, that are U.S. citizens right now. But I remember I, I asked her on my last day at work, so her name was Rao, Rao, what would you do last night? And she explained to me that um, she and her family had watched a Disney movie, A Parent Trap, which was a movie I watched as a child. Yeah. And I thought to myself, and I asked her, would you have normally watched that kind of movie? And she said, no, you know, in the Iraq that she had, had you know, had gr grown up with, um, that wasn't the norm. And for some reason I felt that, that, you know, not that I was there to change her culture or her views or anything, but it seemed very normal to me. That um, it, it, it feel very, it felt very, um, it gave me a sense of, of justification that I was there and somehow I was making a difference to her and to a lot of people in Iraq. Then I remember that, um, that I, I went to say goodbye at, at, at the U.S. Embassy and, and outside the ambassador's door, there, were, there was two photographs and someone had taken a photograph of Baghdad, you know, it, way in the distance. The embassy was in the green zone, but way in the distance in what we call the red zone, regular Baghdad, there was this photograph and then another photograph next to it. And it took me a second looking at the photographs to understand it. It looked like the exact same picture. And then I noticed in the second picture all the, um, the antennas. And antennas. I realized that, yeah, just antennas. So you saw all these rooftops in the first picture. All right. And then in the second picture, you saw all these antennas. And for some reason, I felt that... Um, that we had brought a lot of information to people who didn't know differently. You know, they, they, we, you know, they we brought the internet. We brought, you yeah. know. Looking back now, I would, you know, I, I would be more reticent to say that was a good thing to bring our culture, to bring Western values to them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a long debate amongst many people. But I could say that um, that I wasn't tormented while I was in Iraq. I wasn't tormented in feelings that I was there doing something that that. I didn't. I, I was in cognizance with with the mission, with the role, and what where where the United States um, felt their role was in Iraq. I was in cognizance of that at the time. I will say that has tempered a lot since then. Yeah. But but I, at the same time, I don't have any regrets. And the same thing for Afghanistan. When I was in Afghanistan, I um, for right or wrong, I saw a lot of ways that their society could benefit from from a more um, from a more modern worldview mm -hmm. and I'm being very technical there yeah. very, a more modern worldview I mean I saw things like I remember going with some Canadian uh, uh, some Canadian doctors to a clinic and uh, 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 the the Taliban had destroyed the clinic with the belief that um, that science shouldn't play a part, it, it was a um, it was a birth clinic, and and they felt uh, it was shown to us that they had destroyed it because they felt that science shouldn't be a part of bringing a, a new life in. It should all be you know according to God. And and I'm not trying to be religious here, but there was a prevailing sense early on. Um, I had another experience where, where um, I went to a meteorological station with a team that was trying to replace the science of meteorology in, in, in Kabul. Once again, the, 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 the Taliban regime had destroyed the meteorological capability because they felt everything was, was the will of, of Allah. And yeah. so, you know, but, but, but that had a terrible impact because, you know, crops and the modern world depends on being able to predict, predict rain yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and it just had this effect, you know. So, I, you know, I give those, you know, I, I'm not comfortable giving those two examples because obviously it, I, I don't want to come across like I'm attacking no, a, sure. a religion sure. at all. Yeah. But, but there was a sense to me that, 
there was a lot that could be done to find the right balance where yeah. we could um, have a lot of respect for their culture and certainly for their religion. I think I think Islam is just a wonderful religion, unlike many other religions, could be very misinterpreted. Yeah, agreed. but I, I had the sense that, that we were doing a lot of good. So yeah. I hope that answered that question. Oh man, that 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 really um <laughs> that really it it's it's a really slippery slope to be on because you know, you kind of, when you sort of experience a different culture as an outsider, yeah. it's tough to come in with this. Well, some people do it, but it's tough for a, 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 an empathetic person to come in with this, this belief that, you know, you know what's best for other yeah. people. However, when uh, it becomes a, a human rights issue in certain regards, um, especially in certain countries that are perhaps overly dominated by uh, antiquated religious beliefs. Okay. Um, and again, who are we to, to really pronounce on these things? So it, there's no conclusion to this. It's just, it's like I said, it's slippery yeah. slope. Um, but yeah, and I, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because that just, your answer answered my question, but made it so much more complicated, uh, which I love. I love that. Someone shared a little man to me the other day and it said something along the lines of, wow, we, we, we replaced the Taliban and spent you know, how much of a billion of do dollars, went through so many presidents, so many people lost their lives so that, that we could have the Taliban back in power. And so yeah. when, I, when so, and I see something like that, then I question, and of course, when I saw that withdrawal, the, the way the withdrawal was handled from Afghanistan, and, and the anguish and, and, and the way, you know, just, just kind of the abruptness of it. And I, I don't know it could have been done any differently. Yeah. But I know for myself and a lot of people, of thousands of people who would have served in Afghanistan, there's that sense then that... Well, what was it all for? What was it, for? What was it all for? Yeah. You know, was no. it worth it? And especially when, when you were around so much death, death on both sides, you know, I, I really saw an extraordinary amount, amount of death. And, um, and I, yeah, I, I did um, 13 funerals, you know, where I was um, on one of my tours at the Pentagon. I, I was the, the funeral officer for the Marine Corps. So I used to have to dress and go across the Arlington Cemetery to represent the Marine Corps for Marine officer funerals. And I, I did about 13 of them. And um, boy, it's the saddest thing you could do. And, and, and they weren't all like, like, they weren't all um, Afghan, Iraq era. Some were World War II veterans, and, and yeah. so those were very proud. And you know, but 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 there were quite a few that was in that section of, of Arlington Cemetery that was specifically reserved for for veterans. And and of course, with those funerals, you had the the, the wife or the young children and stuff. So it 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 makes the question you ask a very very sensitive question for somebody like me because there's uh, you know it's just it's probably the least favorite thing you do in a service where you kneel and, and give a brief speech and, and give a, a folded flag to a widow. And, and unfortunately, I've done it more times than I, I would enjoy doing. Thank you. Thank you for opening up about that. I, I know that's hard. And, um, you know, especially in the circumstance and to do it continuously and, and you know, uh, really get a, a, a deep understanding of how fragile life is on, on both regards and, yeah. you know, in, in every sense almost. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of, just building on that, w what is it like to, to have to live every day uh, in operation, in military operation and, and sort of fear? How do you look at combat? I mean, because, you know, like, like you rightfully said, it, it, it's a huge toll to have to go through the aftermath of tragedy. But how do you keep it together every day so you can get the job done um, and the operation isn't like uh, compromised by, you know, hesitation? You know, one of the, um, like, Good military movies, good war movies, or shows like Band of Brothers and stuff like that, really depict combat well. 
Because I think it's for the vast majority of people, even if they were in World War II, even if they were in Vietnam or so, a, a combat deployment is, is lots and lots of nothing happening and then a lot happening very, very quickly. It's just, just a lot of that. And um, so I, I want to clear that and myth for any of your audience that, you know, you go on a combat deployment, you go to Iraq for a, ye a year, and you are just fighting for a year. Absolutely not. I mean, I went to dinner, you know, with my colleagues, and there was just, there was just, there was just a lot of, of, of a lot not happening. And then it would happen. And I think that, that we use the term combat mindset. I think that, that, that for a role like that and in preparation to deploy, you got to be kind of mentally prepared. And then you have, have the sense that you're good at what you do. You have to have a high level of trust in your peers. I think that um, I've seen some great, um, I've, I've seen some, some great, is Sebastian Younger, or Younger, or however you pronounce his name, he does a great show where a TED talk, mm -hmm. where he talks about why young men miss combat. And I gotta say, I, I totally get it, and just about every combat veteran that watches him and describe that would, would understand. He's really managed to get into the mind of young people who go, go to, to war. Because I think that going to war just has a way of heightening your, you know, so it would be hard to live in a civilian world, to live in a, the a normal world, and, and experience that rush, that um, that sense of um, that sense of dependency on the person to your left and right. And there's a very there's a lot lots of times you you hear within the brotherhood of military people that they're not doing it. It comes down to not doing it for your country. You, you really get to the point where you're doing it for the guys that you're you're with. Yeah. There's a. Uh, I think um. Sorry, just to. Check that. I don't know if you've seen Hurt Locker. I think that, I see that. yeah, that yeah. that kind of sort of talks about that. And that was that was a brilliant movie. I um, yeah, I, I really I watched that, and you know, I, I kind of <laughs> related that to everything you're saying because it's like you know, you just you, you can't really leave the game that easily. Yeah, you always want to go back, and even when you're post service, um, you know, it's like it's again, you kind of almost crave in that rush or whatever. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's for most for, for a lot of people. It, 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 there's there's an adrenaline rush that when somebody is trying to hurt you, when you're trying to survive, that that that, and you put it all put it all together with with the camaraderie of the people you're yeah. with and the experience. I once told somebody that 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 when things weren't going well for me in Iraq, meaning that somebody was shooting at me, I I remember, for instance hiding behind a vehicle or I should say taking cover behind a vehicle and um, rounds were impacting on the ground near to me. And I remember that the only thought going through my mind was I wonder what my brothers are doing right now. And I, I know you know both my brothers. And I was thinking about them and I wonder if they, they realized that, you know, whatever they're doing, here I am and look what's happening to me. And for some reason I had this feeling that it was just surreal, that you know, and yeah. You know, but again, that didn't have happen often. In fact, it was quite the ex exception where you were in a position where you were that spiked. I mean, I I could literally count like maybe 10 times. But those 10 times are usually 10 times too many. Yeah, <laughs> you know, when yeah. when it when they're happening. But but it's it you know, in a whole year in Iraq, you know, you you for most people now, that's my experience. I can tell you that I'm sure there were, I know, and not I'm sure, I know that there are many other young, younger people than me, you know, um, that would have had terrible experiences there. Yeah. I, and I think my experience was terrible, but, you know, I don't think we go through life trying to compare, you know, who had the worst experience yeah, in Iraq. Sure. I can say that, that the year I went to Iraq, 2006 or 2007, is considered the most violent time in Iraq for the entire time that the U.S. was there. Um, I, I consider that a feather in my cap because I would want to have been there at the most violent time. I think that I just have the kind of personality that I thrived. I felt that I, I felt that by me doing there and being good at what I did, I was probably saving someone else who would be less qualified, if you know what I mean. In yeah. other words, 
I really felt I was very, very good at what I did, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, I, I would have hated to think that somebody less, less enthusiastic and less um, good or skillful at what he was doing um, could get hurt. It's just kind of odd reasoning, but yeah, you know. no, for sure. I um, <laughs> I, yeah, there's so many um, questions of of combat I have, which I'll refrain from asking because I think uh, I think you know, uh, I, I would hate to make you go through all that, but also there are a lot of other things that these kind of questions will come back as well. So, mm. I I really thank you for sharing that experience, and and I I can't tell you how appreciative I am. Um, of you coming here to do that. I know that takes a lot. And, you know, these things are, are very intense. I don't have to tell you, but uh, very intense life experiences. <clears throat> and it's a privilege to to be able to hear this and, and to have you share it um, with with people who will want to know more about, you know, military and, and what that actually entails. Because we here in Guyana don't necessarily um, know as Guyanese. And I'm not talking about people in the military. I'm talking about citizens like myself um and it it brings me to <clears throat> uh current day events and this is kind of what we started build up to i just wanted to have that talk with you to you know show that you know what you're talking about and you clearly do um but so recently uh we've been having our um it's the the it's been reignited the, the border dispute with neighboring Venezuela. And I, and I won't go into all the details of uh, 1899 and the Geneva Agreement and, and all the, 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 I think that's well available in the media. And before we start this conversation, I would just want to implore uh, the viewership that, you know, we're going to have conversations on, on national issues, hypotheticals, um, just, you know, potential strategy uh, from an experienced individual with an opinion um, this is all to just offer as much information as I can. So I really implore um, the viewers of this to please do not be afraid to go and do your own research. Make your own informed opinions. What we're saying here is not gospel. We're just adding to the information that's available out there. Ultimately, we as Guyanese have to make these decisions for ourselves and be informed. Okay, that's so I think, I think I just want to start with that. And, um, you know, and just have a trigger warning for anybody who might find these things uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, funny I'm talking to a military guy and offering a trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so r currently we're going through this um, situation with Venezuela. And, you know, this is something that Gan has never really seen before. Well, we've dealt with this conflict. We've been dealing with this conflict. And... Um, you know, I want to say that I'm not really a political guy. I have my opinions, but I don't really like to get too much into politics. I'm quite, I, quite, I find it quite distasteful. However, um, you know, I'm very inspired by the route um, our president is taking um, and sort of fighting this p uh, hypothetical war through diplomacy. I think, you know, going as a citizen of Ghana, I think going to war is a horrible thing. I would not want Guyanese to do that. Mm. Um, so, but, but, you know, as we sort of deal with this, the prospect of conflict becomes, it becomes more prevalent. And there's a lot of posturing from Venezuela. We're seeing a lot of posturing. Um, how do we, how, how, does, how do countries look at this? How are we supposed to look at this? Do we follow the national... Um, strategy of, of diplomacy at all costs or do we start considering other options and i'm talking like s the, the citizens of Ghana, like how what are they supposed to do because like i said we've never had a confrontational experience beyond borders and now it's like you know you're dealing with a military that's not necessarily the strongest on a on a global scale mm -hmm. a population of less than a million versus a population of 20 something million and that alone, the numbers just, it puts us at a disadvantage. So what would you, how would you sort of approach this in terms of how Guyanese should look at this? Bearing in mind that, you know, information is still coming to light. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and that stuff. So we can't ignore that. We don't have all the facts, and this has to play out. But but what do we do right now? I offered an opinion recently that, just like you said, I think the right thing to do is to have a very f- strong diplomacy um, as our number one deterrence. But I really do think that the, the, the perceptions on what Venezuela thinks about Guyana is strong. I don't think Guyanese fully appreciate how Venezuelans think about the Escribo, how it's, a, it's, it's almost a pedagogical um, thing. They, they taught it in school. They, 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 the maps they know is a map that includes um, Guyana, uh, the Escribo, as a zona de reclamacion. I told somebody recently that I went to the, to the Venezuelan embassy in Guyana in about uh, uh, 1996 or so, and right there in, in, in the Venezuelan embassy in Guyana is that map of, of Venezuela that includes the zona de reclamacion. I don't think that... Um, I think that current events show that we can't only rely on diplomacy. I firmly believe that Venezuelans, as they sit over there and they look towards us, they see us as, as, as a, weak, a weak country in the sense that um, we don't have the same determination and the same um, uh, sense that we would fight for, for our country as they, they are. I, I think they're much more enthusiastic. Um, I, I raised that question. I raised a question recently in a forum on why successive Guyana governments haven't done more to keep the issue alive, um, to, 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 to make a Guyanese more aware. And someone gave an interesting answer, one of our, our diplomats that's working the border case. He said, well, we don't have to because we know we're right. So we don't have to drill it into society that Escobar belongs to Guyana because we know it does. So, you know, and I said, yeah, that's all fine and good. But but if the Venezuelans think so, and and I honestly don't believe it's going to go away. I, I think it's a cross-cutting um, issue across Venezuelan society, whether they're the left or the right, rich or poor. All Venezuelans that I encounter seem to feel that way. I told an interesting story once that in 2016 I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and while I w- when I got to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, I did a solo climb, so I didn't have peers to turn to and give a high five. And so I looked around and I saw a group of Venezuelans with their flags planted in the summit. And so I walked over there to say, "Hey guys, congratulations!" and so on. And guess what? I'm from Guyana. And within two minutes. We got into a nasty argument on the summit of the highest mountain in Africa. That argument was so nasty that their guides came to them and said, hey guys, hey guys, you got to save your energy, you got to save your breath. We still got to go down this mountain and going down is quite hard. The point I'm trying to make is that here I am, out of breath, cold, because the top of Mount Kilimanjaro is cold, and I'm in a, I'm in a, heated argument with Venezuelans over Escribo. They really feel strongly about it. What I feel that Guyana needs to do, in addition to the wonderful diplomacy, I think Guyana has done a a wonderful job with diplomacy. I think there's one small black mark. I think that, um, I think in 1966, when the Venezuelans took over the entire Ancoco Island in, in the Cuyuni River, I think we should have done more to, um, to, to I, I know that matter was taken to the ICJ, but I, I think we let that, that, that issue simmer for so long that when people say um, Venezuela is gonna come and annex a part of Guyana, I would argue that they already have. They, they already took the entire Ancoco Island. I don't know if your readers are familiar with, you know, it's a, the boundary went right through the center of that island and at some point, the Venezuelans just decided to occupy the whole island. And th- they made an airstrip there. Uh, I've never seen seen it, but apparently they built an airstrip and they claimed that island for themselves. And we never did anything 
we never push that issue enough. So they've already done this, and that's a terrible precedent if you ask me. Um, but where I'm going with this is that, as you said, there's a, there's a big uh, disequilibrium between the size and the capability of the Venezuelan military and the size of the capability of the Guyana military. When you have two militaries that are in such disequilibrium, we usually, the usual solution is asymmetric warfare. And that is not fighting them on their terms, fighting the Venezuelans or, or, or being showing that we could fight them. We shouldn't even get to fighting them. Just showing that we could fight them in terms that it's going to be very painful for them. I want to make it clear that I'm not, what I'm trying to suggest is deterrence. I think that we've been relying on diplomacy and, and the Venezuelans know that diplomacy is not on their side. They, I'm sure they feel very confident that the, the ruling, the future ruling of the ICJ will not be in their favor. None of the rulings so far in this case, none of the international rulings have been in their favor, and I don't think that's going to change. Yeah. So they're looking for another option, and that other option is, is, is they're considering it is an option by force. And so I think it's incumbent upon a, a Guyana administration to increase our ability to deter them, right? And there's a huge difference between deterrence and, be, and, and fighting. So again, yeah. I want to make it clear. I don't think that we can change the Guyana army, that we can frontally fight the Venezuelan army, no. But, but if we had the right determination, if, if, the people, if the people in Ghana were determined enough and, and we, had, we used the kind of, 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 had a kind of military doctrine where they knew that when you come over and try to occupy, whether it's a small piece of the Escribo, which is the only thing I think they're capable of doing, or you try to occupy the entire Escribo as you're making a claim, be a that's response. going to be... It's going to be a painful experience. Yeah. And, and I truly believe that when the pe folks in the Venezuelan military and their society at large, when they look at Guyana, they don't see that as a painful experience. They see it as something that they can do and get away with it. Yeah. And again, if, 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 if the Russian invasion of Ukraine or the previous the 2007, I think, invasion of the Crimea is anything... It's very hard to project a force. Yeah. And, and Russia, you know, considered one of the strongest militaries in the world. And, and you look at how they're struggling to project force into a country that is next door, and they just have to drive across the border. And I'm sure that anybody who is, is, is not very well-versed in the military must be left scratching their heads and saying, how could the U Ukrainians resist like, yeah. this, this large military? I myself wonder uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's that, that most militaries are not built for force projection. The United States military is one of the few militaries in the world that is configured to go around the other side of the world and, and on cap a can of badass. It's, the, it's one of the few military, to, it's structured, the whole military doctrine of the United States is, is, is to project force overseas so as not to have to fight in America. Similarly, I'm saying that Guyana has to adopt a, a, a military doctrine that we know we're small, we're going to rely on diplomacy, but we're going to have a sufficient deterrence. We're going to make, they, they're going to understand that our population is never going to accept it. We're going to have a whole of country response to you. There's a feeling in Guyana right now that only our military will respond. You know, there are people that say, oh, I'm going to get my slingshot, oh, I'm going to get my pitchfork and stuff. But there isn't, there isn't a national feeling the way the Ukrainians have projected that we're going to fight. You know, even the Russians, I, going back to the Russians, Russia is a country you would never want to invade because there's a sense that while Russians don't fight well when they go, to go abroad, and they go on military adventurisms like they are in Ukraine, there's this sense that Napoleon found out, Adolf Hitler found out, that if you invade them, they're going to fight tooth and nail with yeah. a lot of conviction, with a lot of sacrifice. Somehow in Guyana... Like home court advantage. You know, home court advantage. And, you know, the, the advantage is almost always to the defender. Yeah. 
Well, I, I there's a fami- not, f- familiarity with terrain and stuff well, like that. Well, and th- th- there's a natural advantage that the defender yeah, almost always sure. has. I want to say that I'm not familiar with the military doctrine of the Ghana Defense Force. But for instance, you know, we have a base at, um, at Eterim Bang. And I asked somebody once, if, if the alarms went off, the sirens sounded, the Venezuelans were coming, would they run to their fighting positions and run to the guard tower and try to man and defend the base? Because if, if that's the doctrine, that's the wrong doctrine. If the Venezuelans are coming, you actually want to fall back. You know, the, the, if that alarm goes off, they should be grabbing their bags and they should be running to the jungle to where they've got a cache of weapons and food and stuff like that. And that's what I kind of mean by asymmetric warfare, is fighting the enemy on your own terms. What, what you're trying to do is, is not to win, but not to lose. And there's a famous, there's a famous um, military lead at the end of the Vietnam War where he was in an interview and, and, and the reporter said, um, so did you ever think that you would win against the mighty U.S. military? And, and the guy said, well, you know, I was never trying to win. I never thought I could win. I was just trying to not lose. When you look at the, the, the Venezuela-Ghana border, luckily there's no direct access route towards these areas. There's, there's jungle. So, and I feel like that bodes well for us because that's a, a very arduous task for any, um, you know, invasion. There's, there's just a lot to go through. Now, I know we, we need to remember that, and, and I'm just talking in terms of what peop- the things people say, right? Because Venezuela wants Essequibo, the Essequibo region. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, if Venezuela really wanted to attack us, you know, or hurt us, they would just fly over and, and, and bomb Georgetown or whatever. That's, a pr- I mean, that's a very unrealistic uh, thing. That, that not, would not happen, right? That's not really a... I can't, I can't see that in the realm of, of, yeah. of courses of action at all. Yeah. Um, that, that at least, like, you know, they, they would have to have some significant conflict before anything like that happened. So this, this quote-unquote um, situation, and I want to stay away from terms like war and warfare because I, I really don't want to drive that narrative. But any conflict would basically happen within the Essequibo region, within this sort of thick forested jungle. But Alex, even the term invasion, I'm uncomfortable using. A lot of people throw that term, oh, Venezuela wants to invade Guyana. What's an I, invasion? I, I, Define I, I, that. Because, but, well, well, let me see what it's not. A raid is when you, you go and attack an objective and you withdraw. The withdrawal is planned. Yeah. Right? That's a raid. For an invasion, you're, you're, you're going from zero forces in a country to building it up and having combat superiority in a country in a very short period of time and, and holding. Your, 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 your objective is to hold that terrain. And you, you just said it. You know, somebody, there's a rumor going around that the Venezuelans had asked the Brazilians to, to use their roads to come to Guyana. And I don't believe that at all. But there's a really a big rumor, and the, and the Brazilians, there, many Brazilian people believe that. And um, just today, there's a Brazilian newspaper that published that Brazilian moved more armored units to a road to, to prevent that from happening. I'm not trying to suggest that Venezuela would ever mess with Brazil. But, but for the exact reasons of the terrain, the Venezuelans, even though they're vastly and disproportionately larger than the Ghana Defense Force, would have a very difficult time bringing that force to bear. So for instance, they have tanks. But you know, Venezuelan tanks in Caracas or wherever they are just don't impact you know, Guyana at all, the Escribo at all, because how are they get into Escribo? Yeah. So again, you know, I, I saw um, some writer, John Cotton Mayer, he published in a newspaper this comparison between the two forces. And yes, it's a great comparison. And just like, you know, Russia and Ukraine, you know, big bear, small, you know, but but it's it's the ability and what you can bring to bear. And as you said, that jungle and the terrain there really limits their options to like helicopter-borne operations, 
riverine operations, so small and very vulnerable operations. And so, again, I don't like to see, use the term invade because that somehow suggests that we could wake up one morning and everything on the West Bank of the Essequibo is in the control of, of, of the Venezuelans. That, that is just absolutely implausible. And I, and, and I wouldn't even think that would be their objective. You know, that whole saying, if a tree falls in the, in the middle of a jungle, you know, did it make a sound? You know, like, if no one is there to hear it. Yeah. You know, th th there's a lot of vast jungle. I mean, you know, they, they need to hold, if they were to do anything, they need to hold an, uh, 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 an administrative center. They need to hold like Port Kaichuma. And I truly believe that if, if they were to do anything kinetic, it would be to, to hold a, a border, uh, location, Maruka, and then kind of see how the world responds, and, yeah. and and try to do it in the in the the least violent way. Just just and, and you know just walk in and, and I I don't know there'd yeah. be a lot of resistance, and just see how the world responds. It's almost so, it's almost like you square off with somebody and who throws the first. If I'm in your space yeah. and I'm I'm up on you, but. I ain't throwing nothing, but it's yeah. once it's something yeah. is thrown. It's so like you, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the term war because I, I don't classify that as war yet. Yeah. It, it is far from well, the scale that we would use for a war or even an invasion. Yeah, and I, I, I'm happy you're talking about it in that terms because, it, again, Guyanese are very reactive, and that's fine. Um, well, it's, it's just who we are. Um, so we kind of panic. Um, I mean, I myself, Brian, I'm, I'm, uh, every day I'm waking up trying to look at the news, figure out how much information I can, you know, get and, 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 and get aware. And I understand that, you know, um, government is working hard to resolve this. Um, but, you know, you also want to take in how is this being seen globally? What are what are other countries saying or, or what, what are the powers that be globally saying? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that sort of makes a lot of sense because we throw wrong the, the I word invasion uh, very, very loosely. And, and, I, and I, as long as we can understand that an invasion is not, you know, just this posturing at the border, you know, it, it would be responsible to go and scream that. Um, I want to go back to the national strategy of um, diplomacy. And, you know, how... Well, as you know, again, not to get into the detail, but a lot of this is a result of the upcoming election in Venezuela and a sort of last-ditch effort at retaining power. Now, I have read, and I'm not sure if the numbers are, are super specific, but if Venezuela takes over the Essequibo and as a result, Guyana's oil reserves associated with that, they stand to increase their GDP 25 to 30%, which is a massive... I guess, um, accomplishment if you're running for re-election. Now, I think a lot of uh, Guyanese are, including myself, are uncertain of who really has our back um, in this situation because we have Exxon's there, you know, um, drilling for oil. And as a result, that's a U.S. company and obviously U.S. interests. And there's this feeling that, and it's never been really specified or asserted, but like, you know, should anything happen, we have uh, the U.S. military ready to come in and defend us. Now, I can also consider another way where it's like, you know, I, I don't know what the U.S. military, if we were just look, Exxon is in the U.S. military. And, mm -hmm. you know, if they, if Venezuela claimed the region, What's stopping a company from just saying, "Oh well, you know, we can just do business with <laughs> Venezuela, right?" It's they're not under Exxon per se. Perhaps isn't under any obligation to fight for Guyana's sovereignty. Um, to my knowledge, I, I don't know how this works. Now, what's the response to to that from like a a U.S. you know um, the U.S. military? Because it, it's I don't see this issue being a global priority and it's just ironic that what's happening in in um palestine and israel and then russia and ukraine those are way bigger yeah. global issues um 
it feels the same to us given our capacity, but where do we stand? Like what, like who has our back? You know, who's going to come to our rescue in this war of diplomacy? Um, because, you know, we haven't really heard any definitives yet. And I'm just wondering how do these high level military countries look at this? What, what, what is it just purely the economic interests have to play a big role mm -hmm. because countries look out for themselves, but, you know, what's, you know, what, what's an assurance for us if we're going the diplomatic route? Sure. But let's start with what you mentioned about what Venezuela would acquire. Let's be clear that Venezuela already has the world's largest proven oil reserves. So they already have that, right? Not that they wouldn't want more, but they already have that. But of course, it's not producing at the scale that, that it could have been. Um, that's one point. Then back in early October, the U.S. lifted sanctions, a lot of sanctions on Venezuela to the tune of, I think, of, of like 15 billion or something um, in worth of sanctions with some preconditions. That's all, I just answer it, throw in a lot of little sure, um, tidbits yeah. in. Um, when they lifted that sanctions, it's a it's another U.S. company, Chevron, that's going to that's that's going to be able to take advantage of it. So you got U.S. companies on both sides of the equation: Exxon here in Guyana, and Chevron, which is soon to be here in Guyana if the sale with Hess goes through as expected. He Chevron would be a partner in drilling for oil in Guyana and in Venezuela at the same time. You mentioned what would Exxon do? Why would they care? Um, like I actually have a feeling that that um, that if if Venezuela was to do something kinetic, meaning use force, they wouldn't touch our oil production because it, it stands to reason that in their rationale, Exxon is working in an area, the Starbuck block, most of it is in an area that belongs to Venezuela. So there's no reason to go and destroy them. The, the re, you would want to just take the Esquibo and then tell Exxon, okay, now you're, you, you know, you're now working for us. You're now partnered with us. You know, so there's no reason to, you know, a lot of people say, oh, Exxon will get involved. Exxon is going to do something to defend the rigs and stuff like that. That's other hog, hogwash, you know, the Exxon is the most safety conscious, the most one of the most risk averse in terms of physical risk um, companies in the world today. You know, the days of, of big multinational companies like hiring armies and stuff and, and kind of shaping the environment that they work in to suit themselves better um, from a physical sense, you know, not, not from a, you know, like politicians and all that, from a physical sense, those days are gone. You know, so I, I don't expect that Exxon would ever hire like mercenaries to, or, 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 or contribute. They would just stop production and they would wait, you know, pull out their people and wait for the dust to settle. And they'll work for whoever's in charge. You know, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say directly is let's call a spade a spade. Exxon is not part of the issue. Exxon is not wedded to Guyana or to Venezuela. Exxon is there to produce oil. They're a company. They're, they, they're interested in the bottom line for their, for their investors. And whether they're partnered with Hess and Sanak and the Guyana government or Hess and Sanak and the Venezuelan government, you know, you know they, they'll make statements and stuff like that, but I, I don't think they're part of the, the equation. Yeah. With if the U.S. would respond... A lot of people, I have a lot of friends that say, oh my gosh, if Venezuela ever comes over, the U.S. is going to respond and kick their butts. Well, that's, that's easy to say, but the fact of the matter is Guyana does not have a defense pact with the United States. So there's no, the United States is on absolutely no obligation to come to our defense if Venezuela attacks. We have, through different mechanisms, um, what are called security cooperation agreements. And those security cooperation agreements, it's easy to read them and think they're, you know, they, they mention stuff like sanctuary of borders and respecting borders and protecting borders. But, but those have to do with more with law enforcement. You know, th th those have to do more with 
preventing the smuggling of, of drugs, of, of, of guns, of people, and so on. You know, so when, when as, as what happened very recently, um, just a few weeks ago, the U.S. in St. Lucia, I think, signed an agreement with a number of CARICOM countries, but, but that's not a defense pact. That, that's a that's a security cooperation agreement. Yeah. So they're under no obligation. To they're fight under, they're under no obligation. And the way the U.S. The, the 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 tone of the U.S. now, if you look at Haiti, the U.S. is not going to unilaterally get involved in, in, in anything kinetic that it, it isn't critical to the U.S. And, and, and Guyana is not critical to the U.S. So what I would expect to happen is if if Venezuela did something. It would, the issue would get punted to the UN, to the, to the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that of the, of the five um, member nations with veto power, there's China, which will almost certainly abstain. There's Russia, that would certainly vote in favor of, um, of, Venezuela. of Venezuela. You know, but, but you know, the US would wait for some kind of chapter six or chapter seven mechanism from the UN before they came under the auspices of, of, of a UN charter to intervene. I find it very unlikely. Does, does Venezuela disregarding um, any ICJ uh, decision on this matter automatically uh, give reason? Does that, does that trigger um, reasonable cause for country like the U.S. to act, given that, you know, this is a, a global body that, you know, governs most of the world. Sure, sure. No. Well, Venezuela obviously is a member of the United Nations and the ICJ is, an, is like an appellate court for the United Nations. So, you know, but Venezuela has made it very clear that they're not abiding by and they don't respect the rulings of the ICJ, even though, as we saw, they showed up for the, um, for the provisional um, to make an oral case in, in, this, in this case. Um, they, 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 as far as I remember, they didn't show up to argue the, the case of, of, um, of Esquibo, but they did show up when Guyana went to the ICJ to try to... Um, to, to, to rule against the, the referendum. Yeah. So Venezuela showed up for that. Yeah. Um, but they've, made, they've always made it very clear that, that they're not abiding by the ICJ. And, and you know, I, I made a comment recently that... They, you know, they've made it clear, but they've still partook in, in proceedings. This, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, Which and is if, strange to me. But if you read what they wrote in their statements, they actually couch the ICJ ruling as a, as a victory. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at the statements by Venezuelans, Venezuelans are told that Guyana went to the ICJ to stop the referendum, and so that because the ICJ did not rule that Venezuela could not have a referendum, to Venezuelans, it was victory. Yeah. So it's only in but, our but the mindset. ICJ, but, but in terms of a referendum, ICJ really doesn't have a say. It doesn't have that. the authority. Yeah. It doesn't have the authority. But but Venezuelans were led to believe that that, yeah. that they won this it's just because suspend. there isn't a ruling that said you know the, the the ICJ ruling in essence says that um, directed not just Venezuela that both nations would do nothing to jeopardize the the consideration that the court is going through right now until they issue a final ruling. You know, but it's it's directed at both countries, both Guyana and Venezuela. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's really interesting to to see how it's gonna play out, and and it's I I, I speak to friends about this every day because it's it's a hot topic right now. Sure. Um, it's our country. We want to rally behind what we could do, and I think the best thing we can do right now, like I said earlier, is being informed mm -hmm. um, on all cases. I know the the war of the Diplomacy entails not to fear monger, not to spread misinformation. And sometimes a part of me feels guilty even discussing hypotheticals because, you know, it just riles people, people up. But I, then I also think to myself that us just putting our heads in the sand about this matter sure. is worse because yeah. then we have no idea. We're just relying on, on one body saying this and that on their time, which is, is important like for, for government, for example, to, to, that's the main form of communication that we all need to follow. But we do need to really discuss and, and you know, disagree 
and and agree and you know do as much as we can so i just want to keep keep pushing that idea um so i want to say i want to switch um lanes here you know we talk about a potential um raid or or movement on the borders and whatnot you know and we know that invasion implies is a very big term that should not be used loosely um we know the current military capacity in some regard of what we have without any external help mm-hmm. where are we right now we've we've we sort of you know we're in a position where we need to make some sort of uh move or reinforcement to our current systems and, and resources what is the way forward with regards to that like what is, what can we do to strengthen national um pride to strengthen our capacity our military capacity and to sort of show a country like venezuela that you know we're not a pushover nation like we're going to we're going to you know um we're going to make it hard to 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 for them to you know our as we defend our country we're we're not going down without resistance you know i don't want to use terms like fight and stuff like that but we are behind you know we're behind guyana what what can we do um in that regard well it's very clear to me that guyana has made a decision to be as on provocative as possible yeah so when you look at even um, me speaking right now i'm trying to find the words to not be prov- like you know well, to well, not well so the military side of me would say you know when president ali went to the border why didn't i see more images of you know like him in a fighting hole with guyanese soldiers in the fighting holes in their full battle gear and he's looking across the border at, you know in binoculars the kind of thing that you know the north korean president would do we didn't see that and it's deliberate and i don't disagree with it at all we are trying to to appear as um as non confrontational as possible yeah. and and it goes against the theory i said i i mentioned early in a program that i think i think that we are overly reliant on diplomacy and we also have to show a little side to us that shows that we have a a capable enough military and the right the right mindset among our population that and our government that that the whole country would come together and resist an attempt by Venezuela i personally would have liked to see more of that but i i am totally on board with the um the kind of the soft approach we we're, we're using right now so again if you remember when when the president went to the border you saw some gdf soldiers around him but you didn't see them in you know you didn't see them looking as if they're you know you, you saw him in a tent sleeping with them they had a meal it was in solidarity yeah right yeah. you didn't you didn't get, he he wasn't there to show that hey we are a strong military we prepared to fight he was there more to build rapport to send a message to to guyanese and stuff and i think i didn't get the impression he was there to send a message to venezuela For more sure. than he was sending a message i felt i felt more personally i felt more unified with him i felt like yeah. he cares Yeah. He cares about what these guys are going through and he's there to show that he's right there with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um I will say that I am more in the know of some of the formal preparations that are taking place and very soon there's going to be an announcement about a, 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 a an allied military and what and their presence here in Guyana and and, and and how that presence can be a deterrent is going to be something within the next couple of days and i'm aware of 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 another allied nation that is that is playing an active role in 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 helping us to i got to be careful how i say this helping us to maintain domain awareness on the border helping us to see what's going on in the border um but that's all i have the liberty of saying right now but but very soon you're going to see you're going to see you're going to see more concrete signs that other militaries are making gestures let's call it gestures to show that 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 
they're they're beyond words and these militaries are acting in, um, unilaterally they're not acting through any kind of treaty with us or anything so you you'll see something here within the next few days yeah i um one of the final couple of questions i have to ask you is that um given this sort of talk we've had about you know um not not a very strong capacity of our military and and what we can do to reinforce that um would we see more uh private um enterprise coming into this uh space of conflict and what i mean by that is like um you know more uh consultants privatized um privatized military to sort of reinforce the uh systems that we have um and to build on that question they say um you know there are people that make money off of war or off of conflict does that pose a significant threat as well because at the same time while we want to um you know strengthen our military we don't want you know that to be done you know we don't want it to be a profit driven thing mm-hmm. because then you know the conflict will just be benefit to whatever suppliers we have and that's kind of a my, my question is, is is that an issue for Ghana because given the you know the sort of the, the smallness as well like is it would it be effective yes good question and i believe it is so the term you're you're looking for is pmc private military contractors and um Yes, they are for-profit militaries, they're private, but they certainly fill a void. And they fill that void when, when as could be happening in Guyana, you know, a, 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 an allied military is not prepared to put boots on the ground. So, I mean, if Venezuela came over and did, like I said, they could do and hold a town, all the diplomacy and all the sanctions might not dislodge them. You might actually have to, 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 to go and actually dislodge them. Or better yet, you might have to increase your de- deterrence posture so they don't come and take the town in the first place. Obviously, I'm a military man, and so I'm leaving. Diplomacy is the right way to go, and I'm not knocking diplomacy. I'm only, I'm only offering military solutions, and I'm not saying they're the only solution. But I feel there's certainly a place for the guy in the government to bring in, to, to contract with, with a private military contractor to bring, to bring a capability here in the short term to act as a deterrence so, so that Venezuela sees us as a harder enemy. Um, as I said, I, I worry that as Venezuelans look east, they see an easy target. I mean, aside from you know um, how, what the international response would be, they see our indigenous response, our gang, our defense force, as small and weak. They see our people as really not motivated the way they are. And, and again, I, I stressed earlier, they are very motivated about this. Um, so, so yes. There is a role for a private military contractor. It would be a huge deterrence, but I'm not saying that that's the decision for the government to make. Um, but I think, it, I think in the short term, where they would come in handy is, is to deter and dissuade the Venezuelans from doing something. I would much rather avoid it than have them come and do something and then have to try to, to respond to that. To size up against a military like Venezuela, the investment in a PMC, and I, I think you can maybe appreciate this um, being in, in, you know, operating in our economy right now, funding a defensive posture, what kind of investment are we looking at? And how does that affect our economic development moving forward? Because a defensive posturing would be indefinite. We don't, we don't just sort of fund this and then, oh, Venezuela said, oh, you know what? We can't, we actually, we enable, we go, we going back, you know? Yeah. So it's like, that's kind of my worry is that if we were to go along the PMC route, how indefinite is this? Just in the short term, 
this is a short term measure to prevent them from doing anything. I um I think the danger time is between now and whenever they hold elections. Gotcha. I, and I and I for one think that the risk of a Venezuelan kinetic action increases as we get closer to their elections if it looks like Maduro could lose and he's not polling well right now. So I, for one, don't think that there's a high risk of him doing something now. I think next year, you know, as we get, as they get closer to the elections, we would have to worry. But but going back to the PMC question, I think that um, for the whole, I, I talked about changing the doctrine, changing the mindset, changing the, the, the tactics and techniques of the Guyana Defense Force. So if it were me, we would bring in a, a, a modest size, and I'm talking in the 20s, 30s, no more than 50, 50. And you would say, well, how could 50 men make a difference? But 50 men, because as I said earlier, because of the way that the limitations on how Venezuela could project force, you know, use the example, they would probably have to come by helicopter. Yeah. And a helicopter is not a, you know, they wouldn't feel very vulnerable right now to the Guyana Defense Force. But if you had PMCs here with, with, with ground-to-air munitions, for example, the Venezuelan military would think twice. So if you took away their ability to fly across the border and you made it, you know, you know they're not going to just land in the middle of the jungle. They're going to, you know, so if, if, you, if you protected the, the, the likely places that they would attack, by by just having, if you think about think about um, the, the famous Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia, how one guy with a with an antiquated RPG shot down a U.S. helicopter, and how it changed the way the U.S. military responded in the future, and how it changed the entire dynamic once that helicopter went down. I mean, it's such a famous event. So imagine if the Venezuelans felt that we could easily shoot down near helicopters. The term we use as man pads, man portable um, ground to air missiles. But but again, I, I don't think when Venezuela looks at the Guyana Defense Force, they don't think we have that capability to kind of deliver that kind of hurt that would make them like think twice about doing something. So again, I think that in the short term, and I mean a very short term, like six months, I see a role for a PMC but because I just don't see an allied nation, a friendly nation, a partner nation coming and putting boots on the ground to defend Guyana. I mean, if, if it weren't the U.S., I don't see the U.S. doing it. And if it weren't for the U.S., I don't see who else would do it, you know? Um, yeah. I, it's interesting. It's it's a very interesting conversation to have because I don't think many people have discussed this um, on a national scale yet. I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. Um, what I've noticed online, and you know, well, you know, I'm in film production and I do a lot of films on Guyana and whatnot. And when I actually entered this business and this market, you know, you'd go online on YouTube, which is what everyone uses for information, um, and you can hardly find information on Guyana. It's gotten better over the last 10 years, let's say. But I found that lately, every time I go on YouTube, and obviously it's, you know, the algorithm is giving you stuff you're looking for, for yeah, sure. Yeah. However, and this, I've never seen this before. And I, I was actually, my mind was blown. People around the world hardly know about that we've hit oil. You know, I talk to people in the US, they still don't know that Guyana is not Ghana, and we're known for Jonestown. <laughs> And, and blah, 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 you know, you go online now and you type in GAN or you, you're searching for GAN in, in its regional um, stance and whatever. And there are so many videos yeah. talking about Ghana versus Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah. What the, and, and, and this, this blew my mind. What does Ghana need to do to fend off a Venezuelan attack? And multiple videos like that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and sort of talk discussing hypothetical um, military conflict. And that blows my mind. Yeah. And it got me thinking that, you know, there's clearly, I'm not saying it's, it's a conspiracy. I'm not saying it's directly related. It very well could be given social media and stuff. But there's obviously a market for PMCs and, 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 and the like, you know. Um, and that's, that's kind of my hesitation 
or or sort of reluctance about uh, you know kind of bridge broaching this topic because it's like we you know i just feel like we're we're a bit vulnerable in that regard to this sort of this sort of marketing um it makes me like uneasy yeah. because it, it feels like this is now out of my control now the market has got involved and this is a, this is a this is the yeah. business opportunity yeah. you know and and for a country like guyana to feel that you know we we hardly understand these dynamics um in terms of like you know ma- marketing online and how this sort of is pushed on us and you know cuz you know as far as pmcs goes that has nothing to do with us that doesn't benefit our economy or or yeah. anything like that so it's a very intimidating thing that's happening that i've noticed yeah. and um you know i just i don't know i don't know what your thoughts uh, are alex i share your your surprise there i really do I, I am i am quite flabbergasted by the amount i've seen too where guys go into detail yeah and it makes me wonder are they guys like you like you know a, 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 a non-state actor just some guy that's interested in the military and what you know because a lot of i don't get the impression that it was made a guy even a guyanese guy doing this you know yeah no neither you, do you, i you get the impression that there are people around the world that just just a lot of them are faceless that kind of yeah. stuff you know yeah. and um and then of course i wonder how much of it could be state sponsored you know it's just just you know it, it, we are as you saw um as you mentioned at the very beginning of the show um, one of my military specialties is information operations, and that's about influencing people. And that 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 role has got much more um, in, uh, techno informative than when I, you know, in, in my days it was billboards, and now it's all TikToks and and YouTube videos and stuff. And and there there must be players out there, it, there must be some kind of mix of state actors or somebody doing it professionally because there's just simply so many videos out there. They're so, some of them are so well produced, you know, like, you know, how, how do you make money doing that? How do you yeah. invest your time and your resources to make these videos? You know, what, I, I don't understand the system, how it works, but it is very surprising and there are a lot of opinions out there. Yeah. Yeah, I just, it's, a, it's, it's a deep discussion. I'm glad. Point. I'm glad we feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, um, I, I could sit down and look <laughs> at those, and and you know, I haven't. I mean, I could pick and choose, but I haven't found any. I haven't found many that were totally off the mark. You yeah. Know, you know, I got the impression that there are young people out there or older people that sit there and study this equation and combine a background, per, perhaps like myself. It, former military or current military, but I haven't found many that were like, oh my gosh, what does this guy say? And he's totally out to lunch. You know, I, I found a few, with, they all have little mistakes here and there, but for the most part, they're pretty well thought out and, and, and you know, and they're driven. And, and very soon you, you can tell if they're, I've seen them on both sides of the equation, by the way. I've seen, I've seen people that seem pro-Venezuelan suggesting what they should do. And, and I'm sure that unless you speak Spanish, you wouldn't, you know, yeah, you wouldn't yeah, pick yeah, up yeah. on much of those. I speak a little. I mean, I mean, I, I can, I can understand, and I can definitely get by. I studied it for a long time, so uh-huh. I, I definitely pick that up too. And I've been looking at both sides of the equation. Good. But but listening Good. to you though is like because you're a military guy, you know what the hell they're talking yeah. about. I all I hear is RPG three and you yeah. know uh, these like these technical weapons and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, I, I it it sounds how they dis- describe the strategy sounds legit, but I, I couldn't tell you, I, you know, I couldn't tell you anything, but the fact that you're saying that, you know, it, it makes some sense to you means that it's obviously not far off the mark. Yeah. I pay more attention, I think, and that's just me by nature. And, and there's, sure. a term, there's a military term for it called red teaming. And it's what would the enemy do? And I pay more attention to that. So I have to admit that when I get bombarded, just like you are with all these videos and news and stuff, I, um, I, I, I take a quick glance at the, at the pro-Western, pro-Guyana views. Where I really dig, you know, I follow Maduro. I follow Maduro on, on his um, Instagram. I follow um, uh, Vladimir, the defense minister. I, I wake up. And I opened my Instagram to see what he did, you know, and, and how militant he was, you know, because sometimes he's preaching to a crowd. 
And then the very next day, he's, he's with their military and they're kneeling and, you know, they're swearing that they're going to go and do something. And so I, um, I, I, I like to listen to the horse's mouth. I, I, um, I told a story once that I was in a room. I, I was working for a, a red team unit. I just described what red teaming is. And I was in a red team unit and we were discussing what, what um, our adversary would do. So let's say the adversary was Osama bin Laden. So we were all around a table, a, a group, group of us, military people, sociologists and all that. And we were discussing, what does he intend to do next? And I remember that this sociologist who was Arab said, you know, he said to us, why don't you just listen to what he says? Why, why is it in your Western culture you sit around and you spend so much time trying to interpret? Why don't you just go with what he says? If he said he's going to invade, why don't you just go with that? Yeah, you know, and it's something that that stuck in my mind for a long time, and and so when I look at when I look at uh, Maduro, I try not to be too interpretive. I I, I try not, you know, I, I try to listen to what he's saying, and and so I focus in on, um, you know, sure I know he he's trying to rile up a crowd. I, I I got a sense of his motives, a more a much more nuanced sense of what his intent is, but for me. I'm particularly looking to see if that would translate into military action. And I think that's the big, big, you know, big concern for everybody, you know, because we were all accustomed to them rattling their swords and saying stuff. Well, to but w w w will, this, will this bring hurt to us, physical yeah. hurt to us? And so I do pay attention to that. But to that point today, uh, December 5th, as we're recording this, um, Kaitro News had on the front page, Maduro says he will not invade Guyana. He, he did? Okay. So that was on Kaichor. I, I got to source that. Um, well, well, I, I think I sent you a message to, uh, yesterday that, that over in Caracas, today at 3 p.m. Caracas time, he invited all the, the accredited diplomats, I assume including Guyana, and all the accredited uh, international organizations to meet in. Yeah, and he was going to say something, and, and I haven't, you know, I've been very busy today. I haven't followed up. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you saw it in Kaicho News today. It's that's probably not what he said. No, but I, I'm waiting for the results on that to see I what think he said. I, again, I have to source that. I didn't read the article. I just somebody sent me the front page. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that out there because uh, <laughs> we're talking about direct statements, right? But again, it's not. I gotta say, I haven't sourced it. So my concern today was. Um, for that meeting is where he convened the meeting. He invited them all to a place called Fort Tayuna, which is a, a, a Venezuelan military establishment, a base in Caracas. And it's also the home of their Ministry of Defense. So I thought that was an odd location to choose to make some statement clearly on the, on the border issue. Yeah. So, okay, well, we'll see. That we, we'll see. All right. Well, um, I think it's that time. I just want to close by saying, um, Brian, thank you so much for coming here. Um, this has been a, a fantastic conversation. Um, thank you for opening up about your experiences. It's, you know, people like you is, you know, you're the kind of person with your unique experiences that we want on this platform to share with younger people, you know? And again, it's not, I, I will reiterate, no, nothing anyone says is gospel. It's just an experience. You're a fellow Guyanese um, with ex experience very relative to our current situation that we could all learn from. Mm. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, as we sort of talk about these topics and continue to discuss, we will feel a sense of uneasiness and, and uncomfortableness. Um, and I, I just want to stress to my audience that, it's important to, you know, be logical, um, be diplomatic. Uh, there are a lot of Venezuelans here in Guyana um, looking for a better life. Uh, and we have, to, we have to acknowledge that. We have to approach that with empathy. And, um, you know, this conflict should not translate into how, um, you know, we treat people in need. Okay. And um, I think that's, a, that's just an important point to stress. Um, because, you know, it, this is a situation that is very important to us um, and our, our heritage and, 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 and in that regard. So, yeah, I just want to put that out there. And I want to give you the floor to just offer any last words. You could take off your military cap 
um, if you want. And, um, you know, just sort of if you have any advice to the the younger generation or, or the people maybe just looking for answers or looking for some sort of, um, you know, uh, confidence, you know, what, what, what can you offer? Yeah. Well, what I would say to young people is, is it's not their fault that they're so ill-prepared for this. I had mentioned earlier in the program, and I mentioned it quite publicly, that I believe that in Guyana, we should take this, this is a, this is a, this is an issue that's not going to go away tomorrow. And, and, and in our, we're just starting to say, and I hope we mean it, that we're going to, we're going to keep this issue, not at a panic level, but, but, but at a, at a, at a, a greater level of awareness and, and being informed. I think for a lot of Guyanese, they're just, they're just so in, they, there must be so many Guyanese that sing, sing Dave Martin's famous song, but don't relate it really to anything. And so I think that, that, that if the shoes were turned um, and we were trying to invade Venezuela, I think Venezuelans w would be, they just, they just have the mindset. We, we don't have the right mindset. We need to, we need to be in a right frame of mind that, that they're, they're, they have this adversary opinion about their Sequibo and, and it could happen. I, um, I, I corrected a, a, a very educated person, a, an author, who said that I expect, he wrote a, a report, and he said that I expect that the next thing that Venezuela is going to do, now that the ICJ is ruled, they're going to go and take, take over the rest of Ancoco Island. And I'm, am I'm amazed that a PhD guy, you know, so well read, doesn't know that they took over Ancoco Island since 1966. And that, so to me, if he doesn't realize that, I could imagine the young people that don't know. And so, so, so there's, you know, the uncertainty and the lack of information and awareness breeds that kind of anxiety. So I would become better inform, informed. I would not extrapolate what you see in, in, in Israel and Palestine and what you see in Ukraine. No, ex I can understand how some young people might be using words that we put off limits today, like invasion and war, and just and just conflating it to our situation in Guyana. I just I just don't see anything at that scale happening, anything at all. I want to thank you for having me here. I want to say that you know I'm going to walk out this door and I'm going to say, wow, I um, it really says a lot of how I feel about you and your character. That you know I don't. Um, Military people don't comfortably talk about their military experience at all. And, um, and so it, 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 it's a testament to you and your interviewing skills and your reputation that you could make me feel so comfortable that, um, yes, you did warm me up, but to ask me to talk about like, my combat experiences, um, that's an awkward question. It's an awkward question for for me to talk to with somebody like you, that, that's a conversation you only have with your peers, normally with a few beers to kind of loosen your tongue. But um, I want to say that you handle that very well. I suspect that you're gonna go, you guys are going to go very far in this role that you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing. I wish there was more of this. And um, I think that, that what you're doing and what you're attempting to do, which is going to increase a lot of awareness, and I'm just saying my interview, I'm saying on all the topics you touch on in Guyana, tourism and so on, and the economy, keep it up. Thank you for what you're doing. For Thank both, you, Brian. Both of you. And, all right. Thank you so much. Okay.